starts now. So again, welcome. <laughs> so for anyone who's listening in now, um, this is the UAP tracking forum. Um, we're doing an AMA live session uh, where anything is can be asked and I hope we can answer your questions. Um, I will give you first of all a, a short overview of what it is it actually about. So a year ago, one and a half years ago, Skyhub decided as an organization to create a, a community around its effort to uh, build a hard and software platform for sky observation issues, <coughs> most of all uh, UAP tracking issues. Um, it started with uh, Rocket Jet and now we are on uh, Discord channel. As you are all familiar with, Skyhub closed its doors in, in August. So the supporting organization behind the, the community here on Discord closed its doors. And we as, let's say, the European uh, team members decided to go on with another organization. That time we founded it in, in Europe because we are in Europe. And Basically, we do more or less the same as Skype was intended to do, to support the community, to co-develop with the community, soft and hardware. And our, let's say, high dedicated goal is to cast a wide net of sensors, sensor platform stations uh, on, this, on this planet. Yeah. I will later on tell you that it's not uh, such a high taken um, um, wish or you say challenge because it's actually a limited number of stations that is actually needed Th the number is still high but it's doable it's doable in a couple of years so as you now know this endeavor UAP tracking um, is twofold so on the one side is the community, it's you, it's, uh, it's us, because we are ourselves that part of the community. And the other part is this organizations that organization that we created. Um, it's in the process of registration. It should be registered in this coming week um, to support the effort, because the effort needs more than just the community. I mean that by looking for partnerships, maybe getting grants for, for development, for hardware partners to, to hardware producing companies and so forth. So there is to be needed an entity, uh, a legal entity that, that can uh, go those routes. Um, so this is the community. It has now more over 900 members. Um, because it is an, uh, a one-year-old uh, community, there are still a lot of people who are, did not come back after Skyhub uh, decided to stop. But there is a lot of people who are still on the fence um, to just to see what is developing and how it is yeah, evolving, let's say. So, and, and one of the uh, important people here are uh, Brad and Martin, um, Brad is called Brad, that's simple, and Martin isn't there yet. Um, because he's going to be joining in a bit. He's joining in a minute because he was stuck in a traffic jam somewhere in Denmark. Um, as you already heard, this is a global effort. So me personally, I'm in Austria. Um, Brad is in San Francisco. Martin is in Denmark. Um, Tommy, you are uh, in Texas somewhere. That don't make it yeah. <laughs> more accurate than this. Yeah. Um, so what I want to say with this, and, and Kristen is in Germany, and David is in Scotland and so forth. So what I want to say with this, this is a global effort. So we are a global community, and we see ourselves as such, meaning we need uh, people can be there for support and help and, and discussions. and. I want to point out our two moderators, which is Brad, who is placed in California. Not no, to be more precise Andrew. here, <laughs> but he covers oh, Topeka, the Kansas. Yeah, excuse me. Oh, it's Topeka, Kansas. I'm in the middle of the country. Oh, sorry. Uh, my
my confusion. It's <laughs> Paul in, in California. Sorry, Paul. I, I mixed you up with in Kansas. So yeah, Kansas is perfect because it's in the middle of, of the United States <coughs> somewhere. Um, meaning we cover two two major time zones: the European time zone with Martin, and the U.S. time zone uh, with Brad. Maybe there's someone in the future from Russia or Asia or China uh, who covers that part of the planet. <coughs> so basically those two people are the, the our front ends, people who, who, who are more or less very often in the community can be asked things. If you target questions towards, let's say, the organization, these are first contacts. Me, I'm always on, as you, as you are already know. And Christian is now there. Christian, welcome. Okay, so I follow up. Um, Christian, I'm just uh, giving a rundown of uh, what happened the last year and what we are now heading up to. So um, I was just introducing some people. I was introducing um, Brett and uh, Martin as acting as moderators for the community, as direct uh, people can be addressed with, with anything if you, me, are not there. So there's always one uh, who can be addressed. So UAP tracking, um, the question is, this is actually a ask me anything uh, session. So actually uh, questions should come from you and we try to answer. Uh, I don't want to go too much now into details of my uh, storyline here because it's already 10 minutes after a after the, the session started. So if there are any, any questions, please drop in immediately and, and, and ask. So are there any questions up to now? All right then, so let's talk about what is it actually? What is UAP tracking? Um, our core philosophy is to get, <coughs> because we, what, what we all want to know is, is it true? Is there really something going on in our atmospheres? Um, we have a lot of people who see things, m myself, I see them very often when we are in the Alps and have a clear sky. So you, we very often see things that behave, don't behave uh, like they should if there would be a satellite. So satellites don't make 90 degree turns, something like this. Um, there's something going on. It's not ours, I'm for sure. And we just want to prove what, what is going on. And that's why we need an equipment that is able to detect that. Um, our core and main detection system is still um, visual, meaning we use a two-part system, which is one hand is an all sky camera that scans the sky on a 24 seven base all the time, all the year, and detects events if there's something going on that shouldn't be there. Um, like a smoke or uh, clouds, anything that, that is, let's say, normal to the scenery. The things that are no no normal to the scenery are things like birds, insects, planes, drones, satellites, um, meteors, you name it, all the things that fly through our atmosphere. And we just want to know what it is. If it's a bird, if it's a plane, what, what our system is seeing, that's okay. Yeah, We can skip this and wait for the next event to turn up. And the end goal is to get um, events that are interesting in enough to steer the PT set, which is a pan tilt zoom camera, towards that event somewhere in the sky. So we we steer our pan tilt zoom cam there, and with a 40 times zoom, right now for this equipment we are now developing, but it could be extended in the future. Um, we want to make high quality with a very good stable moving head and track that object, high quality video and tracking that object, whatever that is. If it's still a plane, a high flying plane, then we can tag that video as a plane video. And it helps probably for the, f uh, the old sky cam to train the material so it becomes more liable to identify whatever occurs in the sky. So this is actually the, the visual part of it, and that's the thing that we want to develop first and concentrate on first. 
because it's very important to um, to prove it in, a, in an optical way because we as humans we believe things we see we can perceive and understand it's more difficult to to analyze and understand an, an, an SDR readout let's say uh, a waterfall of um, a wide band of, of radio frequencies and it's hard to 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 analyze that as a human as you see them coming in via the autofall but there are other ways to visualize this and some people are working on SDR already um, you're certainly familiar with Bob McGuire who is one of the uh, let's say one one of the five people who know what SDR really is he developed SDR from the beginning 30 years ago and he's now retired and he's still working on it and his idea is to add SDR with um, an equipment that is affordable and has four channels so four antennas and with this four antennas he says he will be able to to track any object up to 400 kilometers distance um, passively which is very important to to the stations themselves because one of the philosophy was with Skype and I want to keep this is that we should not emit anything so we're not shooting at anything nor do we l shade light on it or point a laser gun somewhere we have to keep passive I hope you understand this and if there are questions please come up uh, drop in as they come in uh, uh, the ghost had a question about uh, the planned availability of enclosures in the US yeah the, the be yeah the enclosures uh, there was a big problem in january this year actually the enclosures should be available in january this year but the producer in uk um, had a problem with getting the material the abs material we needed five millimeter sheets of a certain size and they were not available on the market and he even couldn't find it, uh, a manufacturer who could uh, procure this for him so produce this one so we had to wait and it took us half a year until an Austrian company <laughs> decided to produce that material and send it to the UK so the material is, the, is now there it's one ton of that material and we can produce I think 200 enclosures from this um, as soon as our organization is registered and I hope this will be in about a week um, we'll set up uh, all these things along with a bank account a PayPal account credit card and so forth so enable be able to set up an Amazon store where the enclosure can be can be purchased from so there will be a price of of the cost of that uh, of that enclosure which includes the extra materials because there are extra materials with the enclosure it is something like um, the acrylic hood for the little camera for the old for mini old sky cam uh, then there are the, the hinges and a lot of screws and the glue and and sticking tape and so forth so extra material and yeah that's basically it um, we round it up uh, include the the Amazon uh, fees and that's actually the price it is not meant that anything that is produced for the community with the community shall be on a revenue winning base let's say this organization is an NGO NPO nonprofit organization it's not about um, making the money here it's about providing and procuring only uh, we are enthusiasts um, some people think we're crazy because we may leave some uh, opportunities on the road but let's be there let's see what opportuni opportunities show up but uh, for now it's a community effort and we stick to it no questions so are you going to be restarting patreon and structuring yeah. it the same way yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. basically yeah 
for for Patreon because still we need um, money for for all this um, stuff for like the website costs a little bit and and the mails and and the cloud uh, costs and so forth. So there's a lot of little noises that cost money, but basically we need um, some fundings. What is about hardware? We will not get everything from granted by producers, which I mostly try to to achieve but some material is not in that way because it's low cost let's say you have to buy them somewhere and you have to buy several to test them and this costs a little bit of money so we're seeking for donations uh, either one-time donations or monthly donations um, just to cover those costs we will publish um, all incoming money and expanding money so because it's a non-profit organization at the end of the year we have to be on zero so uh, we we will we will publi publish this on our website so that everyone can see it we have to actually because it's a non-profit organization so in somehow in some way we have to publish it and we decided to do it on the website mm. no questions okay so is there anything, let's say, uh, you want to uh, talk about in particular? Something like hardware or software? Otherwise, I just go on. OK. So please interrupt me whenever. So OK, I just proceed. I had, okay, camera, I had, my, I had my microphone on mute. Um, the, uh, as far as the cameras are concerned, are, you gonna, are we sticking with that one camera? Uh, only or because of the shortage you're going to try and work some other options in what's what's the goal on that yeah we definitely um, yeah christian go ahead. I... your part okay um <clears throat> yes uh, we try to get as many uh, cameras as possible working uh, therefore we started uh, with uh, some cameras we have on hand mostly uh, cameras that are used in uh, amateur astronomy uh, but we will try to find uh, very nice chips uh, to do uh, what we want we, we want a, a good resolution um, and uh, we want that the uh, fish eye lens uh, works fine with that resolution uh, that comes from the camera so therefore we produce the paper where uh, we can look up uh, does the camera match uh, the optics and um, what we have uh, uh, we, we had a result uh, during the weekend that we uh, produced um, a focus adapter for uh, using uh, several fisheye optics uh, with uh, several cameras because in, in the uh, in Astronomy, you have got some standard adapters. They, they are from uh, one and a quarter inch to two inch or a C mount or a T mount or an M mount. And all those adapters uh, can be printed uh, in 3D. Uh, they can be bought in middle. And um, we try to, um, to have a collection on hand so that we can use any camera that is coming in. And this is where we are standing now. We have got a shell. Uh, share uh, lens from um, that is normally used for video cameras um, this is combined with an uh, ZWO uh, AZ uh, 120 mini camera this is um, the, the second uh, test equipment um, we've got a TIS cam from the imaging source uh, with a, a 12 uh, millimeter in inch uh, um, in, in, in diameter um, this is the main test equipment uh, and that's what we wanted to provide for for uh, um, the all sky camera the others are optional and if, if someone likes to to uh, has some some optics or cameras on hand then um, we do not uh, um, recommend buying something but um, if you want to to build it yourself feel free and uh, that's why we said okay we have to give the opportunity that um, anyone can build uh, on their own but we will assist by getting the, um, this gear ready 
for the PTZ, we um, chose the uh, um, Maxi of Acuter Optics because it's a small telescope with uh, 37.5 uh, times of magnification. Uh, this, this is the primary magnification. Um, and um, the camera that we can use, therefore, should have at least five megapixels. Or what we try to get is a chip with about 24 megapixels, because then resolution and uh, of the optics and the resolution of the um, camera uh, match in a good way. So that's where we are standing now with the development equipment. So, but to be more specific on the dome cameras, the the Dao Dao uh, Chinese brand cameras that we're all trying to source. Um, I thought you were mentioning something, Richard, about um, we needed to stick with that model because of the IR, because of the uh, the zoom factor, um, um, not zoom factor, but the distance factor. Just there was just a lot of variables to that. Yeah. So um, Skyhub. And it was basically Steve <coughs> who, who developed that, that core uh, video processor. He uh, supports with the Skype software only RTSP cameras. So and oh, okay. streaming cameras. And because okay. Skype is not developed further on at that moment, there is a current yeah. version. It has its problems. I'm not quite sure where the problems are. Corey uh, promised to, to iron out those uh, in the in the in these weeks actually it should be already ironed out but he has issues in family COVID hit the, his family so could be uh, that it takes a little bit more time but at the end this the the goal is that the sky have last version that is developed for rtsp camps is, is th at least working for our soft for our system we're Christian is basically developing from scratch, um, not okay. really from scratch because he uses libraries he developed himself in the cu last couple of decades. <laughs> he can talk more in detail afterwards, uh, but be careful when you ask questions. It could be very detailed. <laughs> you get a very detailed answer, so be careful. <laughs> um, yeah, so with our, what Christian already said, um, the core will support any kind of uh, camera that you hook on. So it could be a USB camera, it could be uh, an Ethernet camera, it could be a, a, a CSI camera, uh, you name it. I, uh, e even, even analog cameras with frame grabbers will work if they yeah. connect to USB or Thunderbolt or whatever. Uh, we, we want to be as open as we can. So uh, connecting a camera shouldn't be a problem. And that's why we, we chose opening up uh, this. And uh, since I made very, very good experiences uh, with uh, the Indy protocol for astronomical uh, cameras uh, in use of it because there you use cameras extensively and, and special cameras too. Um, so we thought that it would be nice that you can connect any camera you like, yeah. even a, a, DS, a, a DSLR uh, camera that could could be handled in some ways. And therefore, um, using what's out there for the last, I think, 20 years now um, as uh, fully functional software like the Indie protocol, um, it's, it's useful to us. So we do not have to, to develop the wheel from scratch. but writing a new tracker software from scratch uh, with uh, the use of, let's say, Python. Um, this comes in handy because we, we uh, can avoid some mistakes that are done uh, with uh, Skyhub already, because this is a very, very closed source system. With uh, Python, we have got plenty of um, libraries that are developed by many people, so uh, these libraries uh, are standard and uh, won't uh, they they won't get orphaned. And I think this is um, an important thing that we, on the one hand, have multiple cameras to choose from. 
because uh, the 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 uh, DAO cameras, I think they they about five hundred fifty dollars uh, or so. That is very is a very very high price for what you can get as a camera. And um, low price or low budget uh, things uh, are nicer to come. And uh, there you can choose from the fisheye lenses um, with a diameter of uh, 60 millimeters. Uh, the resolution is very, very high. Um, we thought of uh, taking the ISS um, as a reference. If we can um, image it with, let's say, up to nine pixels uh, with the um, with the all sky camera then we can uh, image it with up to 120 with a ptz and uh, this is a very very comf comfortable uh, situation then and therefore we said we have to open up the the supported cameras and the supported fish eye lenses yeah so i i certainly agree with that in terms of a goal um, but in terms of development time and testing, would we be better um, having a, a smaller set that we say these are sort of the primary supported set? Um, but there are other things that you know people can plug in and play play around with. Yes. So so any camera that uh, can be plugged in with USB is fine to start. It doesn't matter because the the Indie protocol supports all that already. So if we use it, we have got uh, a network and, and um, a device server that um, that uh, provides us with uh, the interface to the cameras. So right. uh, in terms of things like the optics to um, figure out where the actual coordinates are, they're going to be different for each camera, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, not, not really, because um, in, in it, this lies in uh, the image format. You have got a live feed that we will uh, provide with uh, GStreamer already because it's um, open source. It's the best solution to do that because this is already working in amateur astronomy software. So we, we do not have to, to develop that from scratch. We can just use it. And on the because GStreamer is supported with uh, um, the tracker in Skyhub already, uh, we can uh, recycle the source code and uh, make use of it too. So um, because of having the live feed video stream to work on, um, we just have to develop some some things to uh, to be uh, real time. And this is another goal. So you you can choose whatever um, uh, fish islands you you want. Um, eBay has plenty of them. Uh, for for very very small amount of money and um, okay the cameras will cost a little more but um, for playing around for developing and in testing uh, i think it's a good start but uh, at the end the the goal is to have a substitute for the dahua cam so that you can just buy it from the shelf meaning we're talking with uh, industry partners where we say what we want to have and they give us the equipment for testing and we develop with this and test it and then we can put it on our list of hardware and then you with the link where you can buy it. The goal is for the all sky cam to be able to recognize and track the ISS as a benchmark as Christian said and my focus is to keep it below the $250. Uh, or euros. Yeah, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> Below the 250, whatever currency. <laughs> um, I had a question. He was wanting to know when the uh, new version, the Python version, will be available. Christian. Um, we're doing the code review of the uh, existing algorithms now and Hopefully, we will have um, a concept ready in the end of October. Um, and then we have to decide, uh, or then we have to, to look uh, for some developers that occurred, uh, what they want to do. And um, we are setting up a project management system to uh, define the task we have to do. So I think the the start with with coding will be 
in the first two weeks of November, but I do not know uh, how long it will take because I do not have the, the review and uh, the mind map for it ready. So uh, that will come out in with the concept um, in the end of October. But it's fair to say it's going to take months to develop. Um, since we have some some something to start with, um, I don't think so. Um, so are you, I, I, are you I can just guess. Do you have some code already, or are you starting from scratch? Uh, no, I have some code already because um, I was writing, uh, I, I was uh, developing my own telescope tracking systems w uh, that provided camera use already. So. I have some code to start, and it's already written in Python. But um, I have to to fit it to the uh, cameras we want to use. Uh, I have to to uh, get GStreamer in, and I do not know uh, exactly uh, how many uh, supporting developers we have on hand right now. So I barely can guess uh, how long it will take. Normally, pff, it takes some time. Yes. But since we have to to do the uh, to finish the code review uh, and re-implement some things of it, uh, I think it's better to to um, to answer that question when we have the concept, the final concept uh, that we want to go for. So in the end of October. So the idea with the final concept is not only having a concept about the development and where we are heading to, but also um, what the kind of parts are to be developed so that we can address certain people too. Let's say, for example, address a person like Paul. Uh, <laughs> I address you here with <laughs> for uh, the ML learning stuff. Um, others will specialize in doing more, more to the hardware stuff. Uh, it is still to be discussed, but the idea is to form several teams um, that work par in parallel. And, and Christian, as the development manager, should organize this so it, that there is progress and that all comes together on, on, a, on a peak where we say, okay, this could be a milestone where we're heading for. From, yes, from and a, yeah, sorry. Um, I like to add that uh, we want to use some some generic coding of it so that we define a, a software interface uh, what data is provided. So if if we want to use a, a special codec for the video stream, how the video stream is recorded, these uh, things um, so so that we can uh, get a, a very good interface to the machine learning stuff. So uh, there we have to discuss uh, some things. Uh, what is most uh, suitable to do these tasks? Uh, yes, but the the main focus in the first place will be getting uh, the cameras to to. Uh, to provide data and uh, um, the second step is uh, that we um, will have a concept how data management will be so um, there we are looking for uh, some some ideas um, that uh, how we can um, provide such uh, streams and the machine uh, learning um, division uh, should be uh, very helpful to that um, because then we can discuss how we do it how the the uh, the actual interface has to look so talking about the machine learning part we have paul here and um, paul and me were in discussion last week and uh, he was uh, gracious to to give us a storage space where we can upload um, training material so right now we are uploading 900 gigabyte of training material to his storage and the idea is but paul you can maybe lay it out more in detail yeah so i think the the first stage is just getting the data that we do have up into the uh in this case s3 um and then the, the next phase that uh, i was looking at was um trying to label this um Having had a look through a lot of the videos and having now set up my own Sky Hub, um, I'm a little less enthusiastic about the data than I was originally. There's a lot of 
clouds flying around um, and not many objects that we actually want. So, I mean, in order to train a system, you're going to be looking for thousands of videos. Um, and so I've, I've been doing some research online and there's actually a, somewhere else that's done something similar and they've got so 12 gigs of uh, already labeled data, which may be a better starting point for the ML system. Yes, um, the situation is that with an OSCI game, uh, you you see a lot of nothing. It's a lot of noise without a signal. So 99% of the time there's nothing to see. Um, is it interesting for your network to learn what is nothing? Um. So it, you certainly want to know what's interesting versus what's cloud, right? So it kind of has to get a concept of cloud. Um, but you do need to tell it what you're looking for. And in general, I think that should be anything that's flying, right? Mm. You're not going to be able to get any high resolution stuff. You should be able to get something that's flying. So you should be able to get a plane. You should be able to get a bird and then send those coordinates to the PTZ for a closer inspection. Um, what I'm concerned about with the hello, are you there? <laughs> you dropped out, Paul. You dropped out. We can't hear you. <laughs> it's the robot. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, are you there? We can't hear you. So maybe I can jump in for a second. Um, I'm wondering if the 900 uh, gigabyte of material, maybe that is something for, for people who don't have coding skills and they can maybe filter the material by hand for objects that are interesting and just cut the video to into smaller pieces, maybe. If we have enough people who are willing to do that, maybe it's not, I mean, too yeah. much too much work. I would suggest that because it's 900 gigabyte and 90% is nothing, um, that an automated motion detector should scratch through and see whether there is something significantly moving and just mm. label them automatically as not important. So let's say if then from the yeah. 900 gig, 10, 90 gig remain as there might be something moving, then this would be the material we offer to people to, to look by hand. What you say? Sounds plausible. <laughs> Paul, are you there? I, I'm not a machine learning person. <laughs> no. Me not either. <laughs> okay. Paul, are you there? Okay, so. Yeah, whenever Paul, you you are back in, please tell us. So. Is there any other question regarding the uh, the ident identification part of the all sky cam material? Otherwise, I, I go ahead um, and let's say let's talk about some some goals we want to achieve. Um, I first said we want to cast a wide network of observation stations around this planet. So. Let's assume that if stations are in distance of 30 kilometers to each other, so within a circle of 15 kilometers radius or 30 kilometers diameter, we have two or three stations, let's say three stations on the, on the, on the, on the radius, on the outer line, we can triangle it. And from that, if that network is casted with a certain <laughs> kilometer distance, then we have such a fine mesh that is not existing on this earth. There's no equipment on this planet that can cope with us. And now you think 30 kilometers is actually not much, but actually it is because when you take the, the surface of the earth and you, you put away the water, 
so there's there's just the land masses we would need 660,000 uh, stations but there's still the the deserts the Sahara where you don't have don't have um, power or, or the the Alps the mountains where it's unable to 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 put something there on a 24 7 so remains let's say 25 percent let's say 150,000 stations are actually needed to cover the whole planet Mm-hmm. And what's interesting on top of it is if someone lives, for example, in Los Angeles or in Houston, let's let's call Houston. Um, how many, Tommy, how many stations do you think you would need for Houston to cover whole Houston? I mean, uh, Houston's pretty big. So, I mean, five, See? six. See, what I want to say is we don't need many in one city. It's quite a little number actually Um, yeah yeah and the thing is that maybe we get the partnerships with organizations so to cover whole cities so we're not Mm -hmm. focusing on on grass rooting effort only but also to to widen the net by organizations like universities schools who put the equipment on the on the roofs so and, and it's not that difficult to find five schools in a big uh, city like Houston. Right. So, and even from uh, uh, money-wise, talking uh, about costs, um, our goal, and it was the goal with, with SkyHub, and we want to keep this this way, is that we want to have a three-tier um, approach to, to the hardware. So you can start your hardware investment below the 1,000 barrier, you can level up to the three thousand period, and the high end is uh, should be not more than five thousand dollars. And it's not necessary that you have to take the five thousand. You can start small and add whenever you have time to. And more important, because <coughs> because there are so few only needed for a city, you don't have to do it by your by you alone. So the idea is to promote the the forming of teams. Let's say you have two or three friends of yours in the same city or same area. You just actually, because of the short distance to each other, you just need one station. And you could uh, manage it by yourself and, and finance the costs for them, for such a station by themselves. So that's actually the idea how we want to address the community as such. And no one has to do it by himself all alone. Makes sense, yeah. Besides the people like Tommy, you can afford it easily. <laughs> um, in addition, we want to support existing uh, amateur uh, telescopes um, because they can easily be connected uh, um, to uh, the enclosure uh, to support uh, or refine what the PTZ uh, can see. So. Anyone who has a telescope that can be hooked up to a computer can be useful too. And um, th- normally, uh, those telescopes have a focal length of uh, two meters, uh, and they can can um, image the ISS uh, up to 300 or 400, 500 pixels. And that is a lot, because then you can uh, get uh, geometric details. Uh, so it is an opportunity to, uh, to hook up uh, larger telescopes to it. And that is what we want to um, to apply to. Kind of an external device that is much bigger than the enclosure itself. Yes. To swing around a huge cannon, kind of. A light bucket, we call it. I can't think of the brand, but uh, what about the, what is it, Orbital? Uh, has a real popular uh, computerized, follows the orbits, follows all the stars and everything. Those have some uh, really awesome telescopes on them uh yes they they do and um orbital uh ha- has a, a ground version too it's a i think six inch telescope but with um uh, cmos camera mounted um as the secondary ma- mirror and uh, it is not possible to um, to do long-term exposures uh, that you might need for uh, very, very faint objects. And uh, because of that, it's a very popular uh, telescope, uh, but not very useful to our task. Hmm. 
because we, we, we need with with uh, um, higher magnifications and therefore uh, higher uh, focal lengths, um, we uh, need um, um, the uh, resolutions and uh, therefore uh, we need cameras that can be cooled. Uh, below minus 50 uh, degrees uh, uh, of the ambient uh, temperature and th then they get uh, very very um, um, sensitive to light and uh, we do not need very high exposure times like uh, let's say 10 minutes to record and uh, mm. that makes the uh, the mounts very agile so if you want to 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 track uh, something um that is uh, half as uh, bright as the ISS but uh, let's say uh, with a diameter of uh, 220 meters double size um then we need a much uh, uh, larger telescope uh, to record it with normal cameras but if we can cool the cameras um, then um, we could use smaller telescopes with with uh, less uh, mirror areas, uh, but um, because of the sensitivity, the increased sensitivity, uh, those cameras work fine, and we have the resolution. And those cameras are not that expensive, so um, we are very very uh, easy on having on on adding uh, telescopes amateur telescopes uh, to the enclosure too so you can, we could use both and therefore we get uh, um, a second uh, triangulation in uh, as uh, in in the enclosure set too so that uh, improves uh, the quality mm. Mm. all right paul are you still there Hi, sorry, my connection. Oh, yeah, you, you, um, you can go on. Um, yeah, so I think in answer to your question, for the approach that I'm taking, clouds isn't a very interesting object. It's more like the background. It's the thing that you want to get rid of. Um, but for other people's approach, maybe that sort of data might be useful. Um, I'm planning on getting some better data for flying objects because I live next to an airport. Um, so I'll... I'll I should be able to get some data from that. But I'm looking around online to see if I can find anything that already exists. Um, but back to the data that has been um, captured, that'll be available for other developers if they if they want to to take a look and use it. Just send me a DM. So what do you think about the idea? Because the 900 gigabyte is 90%, let's say nothing, just uh, moving clouds. Um, would you be able to make a little uh, algorithm, a, a motion detector that gives you an idea whether there is a significant motion within an, a video or not, so you can scrub it, so that we can maybe yeah. be left with just 90 gig, 10%? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do have that um, to this OpenCV based tracker um but putting it all together because it's quite a pipeline to put it all together you, you sort of want to filter it down first then you want to do the human classification of the video then you want to do the frame by frame um breakdown and the class human classification of those things so that whole pipeline is probably going to take some time so i'm wondering if there's a faster way so yes it i think it's possible mm -hmm. but there may be a faster way a faster way uh, to to eliminate the the noise you mean yes okay to get, to get data that's good to train uh, the tracker on okay we just have to be sure that the, whatever we train on is um, device independent let's say that it's not only working with a certain kind of a camera so right yeah that makes sense and is it the, the material you were talking about, is this a Fisher material or are you talking about the material that you're producing yourself? Um, the, the material that I was seeing online um, was not fish eye, yeah. um, although I'm not convinced that's going to be the issue. Um, fish eye just makes it go in an odd trajectory. Um, 
So I, I think the, the sort of ML algorithms should be fine with that. Um, that said, I'm not an expert here. I am um, an interested party, and I'm sure there are more capable ML people around. Okay. Um, um, I've got a question. What codec would you prefer? Because there are several in hand. We can use H265 or 64, or go for RV. Um, I mean, 265 is fine at the moment. I think we can address that later as we get to sort of more performance. So the material is not 265, yeah. So um, we had the test um, half year ago with Skyhub where there was someone who came up with testing material, but this testing material was improper for testing for, for training a DNN for the old SkyCam because the resolution of any object within this material was exaggerated high, exaggeratedly high. So meaning any plane there was of high resolution, I think 600 pixels real estate within a, a HD uh, picture. It doesn't make sense because UAPs don't come that close, you know? So <laughs> we need something that reacts on, on very tiny, small amounts of, of pixels to recognize. You know what I mean? Otherwise, we train um, th the network too much on high resolution, whereas the normal material comes in on very tiny solutions, resolutions. Yeah, yeah we could to train it on something that isn't identifiable. Like, it's just a blob. It's moving. Yeah. Um, um, we could use uh, some kind of aperture uh, for default and uh, define it around uh, the detected object. And uh, with that, we can reduce uh, the data uh, to about, let's say, 15 pixels. Because if, if we're using one of the, the cameras we talked earlier, um, we talked about earlier, then uh, we, we uh, just have a few pixels uh, for uh, a moving object detection. So if we define something like 15 to 30 uh, pixels, that reduces uh, the amount of uh, detection uh, for that. Uh, then yeah, for, for uh, that machinery, but um, I think the the um, HGX uh, of Jetson boards uh, is capable of more than 3,072 uh, CUDA cores, and uh, that will fit in uh, very nicely. Yeah, so the question is, how shall we go forward here? Um, we need a testing material. Um, because we need this identifier on, on the old sky cam, um, what materials shall we use? Shall we use uh, material from existing um, fish eye cameras, like the one, the material we have here with the 900 gig, or shall we produce special ones? Any idea? I'd prefer more of a divide and conquer um, approach. So if we can get multiple people that are interested in building um, ML models for this, um, and they can use whichever approach, right? So we, if we can provide a interface that we can plug the ML code into, um, the particular approach is somewhat relevant, and you're just looking for one that and run inference fast. So would that mean that um, there's there could be an interface where people are presented with uh, video material randomly um, up to a certain number per per yeah. item, and uh, but they will still see at ninety percent of the material you wouldn't see just clouds, right? Right. I was talking about for the runtime system. Um, oh, okay, sorry. I, I would, um, I think the first thing is to try and identify a 
um, decent training set. And really, from what I'm seeing, I think it's worth exploring other options than trying to filter our way through the large data set. Now, other people may have other opinions and want to do it that way. At the end of the day, we just need one of us needs to come up with our initial ML model um, that we can use as a V1. And then hopefully we'll have multiple models over time that we can plug in depending on what hardware it's running on um, and that sort of thing. Okay, if I understand you right, uh, you mean that <coughs> uh, you uh, you provided your storage, the S3 storage for the 900 gig. So would people be able to access that storage so they can build at home, let's say? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, that that's your idea. What that's why you do that. Okay. So, what is your suggestion for people that don't have a hub? How can they provide assistance? Yeah, we first need something uh, where people can interact with um, a web UI where this material is presented, and there is an interface where you can put click on the labels. Um, this has to be done first. So. First step is to bring all this 900 gigabyte onto the on Paul's uh, S3 storage, and then we have to rediscuss how uh, we are going to going about it. This material, um, shall we find people who work with it with this material in a way so that we can as get a centralized place where people can just step Oop. in and and for half an hour do some uh, labeling. That would be, I think, so, my point of view, the most, the best way to do it. Yeah. So what we can do is a trial, right? So that you sent me 300 gigs initially, and I already have that up on the um, Amazon labeler. So if the way that that works is I need an email from you, and then if you, someone DMs me their email, uh, it'll send them an invite, and then it'll give them jobs that they can go through and label. Um, and this is the this is the initial video classification so is the movement a cloud is the movement a plane right so you need to put it in like one of six buckets and then we can run that as a trial if we get interesting data out of that maybe we can take it further okay mm -hmm. fair enough yeah that's in a good parallel, idea yeah in parallel what i'm looking at is in the ml world there's already data sets that people do competitions on so there's a data set for people moving and tracking people moving through a shopping center sort of thing. And this data has already been labeled down to the frame level. And, there, and I found one yesterday that's in a similar scenario with um, drones. So it's a drone flying around observing other objects in the sky. And it's already been labeled. Um, so there's planes there, you know, the birds and all this sort of stuff and there's 12 um 12 terabytes of it um so that is a massive training set but whilst not identical to a fisheye camera it does have a lot of the same attributes and so i am wondering if we trained it on some of that data and then applied it to the fisheye what results we'd get okay would be interesting to compare at least <coughs> Absolutely. Um, I think th that those algorithms already work on, on Apache materials. So um, I don't think that uh, the um, the fish eye uh, material uh, would be any different because it's a subset. Right. Okay. And f fish eye is. is uh, is an image uh, where I've got um, uh, a lighted sky, or uh, um, um, even the, the night sky is, is highlighted um, against the surrounding circular. So uh, fisheye cameras have uh, an approach already, and um, so that um, the ML stuff uh, would just have to look uh, on. A subset of it so uh, i don't think that the material that they differ so much mm -hmm. yeah just just uh, the uh, the objects themselves i mean 
I, I, I haven't seen this material. Um, Paul, can you post them s some link to that material that we can view it, how it this looks like? I'm just nervous about um, that we run on the wrong path where we have training material that is too too good. You know? You know what I mean, Paul? Okay, he dropped out. Yeah, so guys, uh, uh, any... Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Paul? Sorry, um, I'm worried about the opposite, whereas we have training data that it is awful, like garbage in, garbage out sort of thing. Um, so I'd prefer really high quality data, but we do need, I'd say, a thousand, like several minutes, good quality data that we then go down into the frames, label each frame, you know, sort of 15 frames a second sort of thing. And that's the, that's the amount of data that we'd be looking to be able to train something on. But is this data also like blob-like, like the objects that you have in a um, fish eye camera? Um, both. So let me put the link in the dev channel right now. In the dev channel, you put it. Yeah. Okay. So you mean your your first step is to train a network with material that is of good quality and then take this network and test it on the material on the natural material of the of a fish eye. Is right. this what you mean? Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's easier said than done. But um, yes, that's the concept. <laughs> I'm not an ML guy, so for me, it's all easy. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> okay. It's like my software being, yeah, it's just a camera. <laughs> it's a camera. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, it be? Oh, it just so you know, uh, everyone in the uh, intern channel, uh, we were kind of gearing up to start a uh, labeling process before Skyhub dissolved. Uh, so there were, I don't know, four or five of us who were going to do grunt work uh, and do labeling ourselves, that data. Uh, so if you just pop in the intern channel, everyone there was kind of already geared towards that. So that might be a good starting point. Intern channel? I don't see that. Interns. I, I'll have to add the ro role or Skyhub interns. Yeah, I don't see the channel, but yeah, I'll happily join. You've got access, Paul? Doesn't look like he does. Okay. I'll add him to the channel. I can. Ready? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, guys, so it's uh, any other questions? Any any ideas we should talk about? So otherwise, I stop the recording and call it the AMA session. Um, but we can um, still still talk about some details if you want. Uh, Ghost had one question uh, about the uh, existing Stellarium software. Uh, it has, I guess, drivers for a lot of telescopes. And he was wondering if that could be modified for this project's needs. Um, yes, of course. If if you have any material on hand, uh, just uh, uh, pass it in the development or in the hardware section, and um, we uh, we brought through it and uh, include it in uh, our concept. And we were going to talk about it, all, uh, of course. So any existing material will help because it speeds up the development process. So nothing is lost. Uh, and if if we are talking about the same uh, stuff already, then uh, that's that's good progress. Okay, so I'd say um, Brett and and Paul, you both follow up on this somehow in the interns. Maybe you can talk about it, how, how we shall approach this. I just want to close this session now because it's over one hour. I stopped the recording now.